great to be here. Welcome to July. Let's pray and we'll get into our text in Revelation chapter 12. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord. God, we praise you for today. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness as we come before you to bow our hearts and our minds, Lord, and unfold your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us the sword of the spirit, the word of truth. You yourself, Lord, to transform us. Your word says the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. God, thank you for your redemption. And we thank you for giving us these words that we're going to read today in Revelation to see the future plan of what you have uh, in store for the enemy and the future kingdom of God. Thank you for bestowing that upon us. We thank you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. An old guy from Pennsylvania dies, and he doesn't go to heaven. He ends up going to hell. When he arrives in hell, Satan decides he wants this man to suffer. So he gives him a job breaking rocks. He gives him a 100-pound sledgehammer to do the work all day long and turns up the heat and humidity as high as possible. And after a few weeks, he comes back to check on the level and suffering of this man. And what he sees astonishes him. The man is happy as can be, smiling and singing with his 100-pound sledgehammer breaking these rocks. The devil asks, man, why are you so happy? The man replies, I'm so happy because this reminds me of growing up in Pennsylvania, working with my dad on the farm in the summer when it was so hot and it was so humid. We had so many great times together. So the devil got really mad, and he decided to change it up. So he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring some rainstorms and, and some hail and some major wind, and, and we're going to make this man really suffer. So a few weeks go by, he comes back, and the devil's shocked. The man is even more happier than before. The devil becoming more angrily asks him why, and the man says, this reminds me of the spring rains with my friends and family back in Pennsylvania where we used to build forts and play outside with our family and get planting for everything. The devil's mad. He's so mad at this point. He's so confused, and all he wants to do is get this man to suffer, so he had a thought. He said, you know what I'll do? I'm going to make it 40 below zero. I'm going to bring snow and freezing rain, and I'm going to make it so cold that this man is going to suffer. A few weeks go by, and he comes back to see how much this man is suffering. When he turns the corner, he sees the man working hard, but even happier than before. And he says, man, I can't believe it. Why are you happy? And the man says, I can't believe it. Hell is frozen over. The Eagles must have won another Super Bowl. <laughs> That's a good one. Crazy story, right? Obviously, this is just an illustration to get us to understand that there's so many misconceptions of the devil. There's a few, I think, that are big ones right away. Here's one. People believe that the devil's not real, right? Just a fictional character. It doesn't really exist. Maybe it's something we saw in Tom and Jerry cartoons with, with, with the good guy on this side and, and the little pitchfork, you know, little red guy that's a pitchfork on your thing, whispering, trying to get you to do bad things. Maybe he's just a fictional character used in stories and jokes. Maybe he's a symbol of evil, but a lot of people think it's not a real thing. Here's the second misconception a lot of us think. That the devil is in hell waiting to torment people. Doesn't happen. The devil is not in hell. He's not there right now. That's his pace of torment where he's going to go and be tormented all the rest of his days. He's not in control. He doesn't have authority. That's not his place. See, what we forget is uh, the devil's a fallen angel. And one of his jobs is to steal, kill, destroy, deceive, and we're going to see it today. He's known as the accuser of the brethren. He brings accusations before God. We see it in the book of Job. He has to come before the throne day and night, and what he does is bring accusations of, of God's children before the Lord. And here, he comes as an angel of light. Meaning, if possible, the elect can even be deceived because what could appear in front of us appears something in the image of God, holy and pleasing. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. He wants to manipulate. And guess what? He's better than anybody you've ever seen. Anybody has ever been an addiction. Better than any movie star ever. Who here thinks about the devil at all? 
Somebody once said, why do I need a devil? I have my job that brings enough pain in my life. I have a wife or a husband that brings enough pain in my life. I don't even need a devil. I got my own heartache. Someone might be saying, if you're here or listening in the future, the devil doesn't bother me at all. He has no business with me. That might be true. Here's what I want you to remember, though. You know what drowning people do? They bring others down with them. Because they're, because they're drowning, they don't know what to do. The natural reflex is to grab on to anything around you and to hold on. Hence, a lot of times when people are drowning, they kill the other person that's coming to save them. This is what I want us to know. The enemy, dra- known as the dragon in here, Satan is real, and there's a war between him and humanity and, and God's kingdom. Now, I know that Satan is real because of the lifestyle I used to live. I've experienced it. There's things that I don't speak of anymore because of the lifestyle I've been through. I know it's real for a fact. Sometimes we think it's a joke or a game to say we shouldn't watch these certain things or listen to these little lyrics, okay? Now, back in the day, there was something called a messenger of Satan. We're going to talk about that later. But one of the things people looked at as a messenger of Satan was the fiddle, all right? Anybody ever hear that song, The Devil Goes Down to Georgia? For centuries, people believed that the fiddle was an influence of the devil. Hence, when people would play music, what comes next? singing, partying, drinking. And uh, the idea of Satan is this messenger through the works of music and entertainment or looking to seduce and pull people away. I know it's real because of the lifestyle I used to live. The thing I want to encourage is it's not a joke and it's not a game. We think it's a joke, we're going to dismiss things, just be like, oh, that's just people getting too weird about stuff, you know, you're not listening, like there's lyrics going backwards. Bro, there's satanic influences everywhere. We can't even see it. This is our second week in Revelation chapter 12. And if we remember, in the end end of Revelation chapter 11, the seventh trumpet is blown, which brings in the final bulls of wrath, the final part of, um, of God's wrath. Now, Chapters 12, 13, and 14 are kind of a break in the center because the bulls of wrath pick up in 15. So 12 through 14, there's this pause that's happening. And we get this idea when we look into the heavens that there's this war waging. Last week, we talked about the, we talked about the characters involved in these wars in the spiritual realms. One of them is referenced by a woman, which is Israel. Another one is Uh, the child, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, Another character is Satan and his demons. Satan here is making war with Israel because the church is already taken out and trying to destroy Jesus and his followers in the kingdom of God. Now that we understand who the players are, we're going to finish out this chapter by picking up in verse 7. and We're going to see something miraculous where Satan is thrown out of heaven. 7 and 8 say this, Revelation 12, chapter 12, verses 7 and 8 says this, And a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. Everybody get that? They did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven, for the battle could be triggered by the rapture of the church. I think I messed something up. Let me see this again. For war broke out in heaven. This usually doesn't happen, so. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his archangels fought with the dragon. And the dragons and his angels fought. And they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven no longer. So there's a war in heaven, right? And there's been a war in heaven since the fall of Satan. But Satan still has to come before God day and night. We've already established that, and I want you guys to understand that. That's the here and now. It's still happening. Satan's dominion is the earth, and he's known as the prince of the air. Now, it's why the Bible describes him in God's word, um, and also describes his demons as spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, in the spiritual 
realm in heaven because there's still a presence of the devil where he has to come before God day and night. We're going to see why in a moment. So there's war between supernatural beings in the heavenly spheres, and it reaches its peak during this time. We see Michael, known as the archangel in here, only mentioned twice or three times in scripture, and his angels are warring with the dragon. Now, we don't know how the war actually takes place. We don't know actually how angels fight. But in my mind, it's like a scene from like the 300 or like gladiators. Anybody remember that? There's like swords and, uh, you know, shields and all sorts of cool stuff. Nobody knows. It's just like what pops into my mind. We have no idea how this war takes place or how it's actually achieved. What we do know is that there's a battle that will be fought. We don't know how, but we know what the cause of it is. See, the text, we see something called an archangel. And people have heard misconceptions. Some people said there's five archangels. There's one, by the way, in Scripture. There's one archangel. He's called the archangel. It's a definite article before it. Um, and his name is Michael. And he's known as the defender of God's people of Israel. Now, here in this text, the dragon, which means Satan, right? It's the metaphor for Satan, must have known Michael from the beginning since they were both created beings. And there's something interesting. This battle we see here in Revelation 12 is not the first time these two have opposed each other. It's happened multiple times. We see, we see it back in Daniel chapter 10. Uh, we see Michael. Um, but we also see uh, where Michael uh, has contentions with the devil in Jude chapter 9. And I'll read it for you. Oh, Jude verse 9 is only one chapter of Jude. It says this, Yet Michael the archangel, in contentions with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring a rallying accusation from him, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. Michael, being one of the strongest, most powerful angels of all time, didn't take his own power and authority to contend with the enemy, simply says, God himself rebukes you. And that caused him to flee right away. The only other reference to an archangel in scripture is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, where it says this, For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's a reference to the rapture. And here we see there's a voice of an archangel as people are being taken up, into the, taken up to the Lord, which means it could possibly mean Michael the archangel is shouting as he confronts Satan's attempt to interfere with the rapture, God's people being taken up. The enemy is at a, has a real, real war. Now, the reference to the dragon and his angels reinforces the truth that the demon hosts are under Satan's command, meaning his army. There's a phrase, waging war, we see throughout the text and it's repeated and it emphasized that there's force and fury that this is an all-out final battle meaning satan is desperately trying to defeat jesus christ and his kingdom and he's warring with israel and you know who else you the bride the uh, of the lamb specifically in this text we'll see they go after the off after the offspring now, Satan ultimately fails and will lose the battle. Um, and by the way, this isn't a battle like Satan versus God, like, like, like they have to contend. God, by the way, God doesn't have to fight. You want to know why? He just wins. He just wins all the time. There's no contention that come against him. We actually see this war is between Satan and Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels. There's a war of these celestial bodies. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 25, he says, And he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. In this verse, Revelation 12, it proves that the devil and his angels are not strong enough. They don't have the power to defeat God, Michael, or his holy angels. This isn't really a war one against another. It's a complete slaughter and defeat. 
There's no, and the text says there's no longer a place for him found in heaven. Meaning he's evicted. It's not a proper abode anymore. He's banished from the kingdom. And what happens is because of heaven's cleansing uh, of, of its earthly pollution and Satan's full fury goes against humanity as he's cast out. One commentator says this. He said, We don't know at what point exactly in the tribulation Satan and his demons will be evicted from heaven. It's not revealed the exact time or date, nor the duration of the battle. We don't know. Is it one day? Is it five days? Is it one second? Uh, But what we know is um, that they will be cast out. Ultimately, they will prevail. How do we know that? Verse 9 tells us. It says, So the great dragon, Satan, was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, and he was, or is, cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The serpent of old is diabolos in Greek. It means devil. The definition is slander, defamer, false accuser. He's known as the accuser of the brethren before God. Don't forget, accusations don't come from God in any way, shape, or form. They're from the devil. He's known as the father of all lies, of evil, you know, and, and, and tempter of sin. He's the deceiver, and we're prone to believe and live in the accusations. But you know what? Here's the truth for us at here and now. When you're ever facing attacks, whenever you're facing accusations, we stand on God's word. Here's a few verses for us to memorize if you can write them down. Romans 8.1. If you're ever getting a text, this is so important. Take a note in your phone, write it down, put, write it up on your mirror, on your card. Make sure it pops up on your phone every day. This is what the word of God says. Romans 8.1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is none. There is zero. It's not a little tiny piece. There is No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's the second part. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The cause is, if you're in Christ, you're no longer driven and live for yourself anymore. Yes, we're tempted and we're pulled away, but we're in Christ. We're fully in Him. We're called to not walk by our own earthly desires anymore, but to be led by the Spirit of God. As the Word says, the Spirit and flesh are in conflict with each other. There's a actual war happening in our bodies when we walk by the Spirit. This is what God said. When we're in Christ, there's no condemnation. Nothing. The devil tries to bring charges. And I don't know if that's anybody here right now. Is anybody here being attacked in any way? Lies being told to you over and over again? It might be by your own mind. It might be messages you're reading in social media. It might even be people around you. They could be saying things, you're not a Christian. If you were a Christian, you wouldn't have those thoughts. If you were a Christian, you wouldn't curse. You wouldn't yell out loud. If you were a Christian, you wouldn't like the Dallas Cowboys. (laughs) Wouldn't be a week without talking about the Cowboys. But in all seriousness, you're not a Christian. You're a bad dad. You're a bad mom. You're a junkie. You can't spend money well. You're bad at this. You can't do your job anymore. Somebody else is better than you. Or the, the main accusation he brings before God, we look back at Job. See, no one is like my servant, Job. Oh, yeah? Satan said, yeah. Paraphrase, oh, yeah? Let me have my way with him. You've given him everything. Let me have my way with him. God says, no, there's no one like him. The enemy brings accusation before God, and then he wants to use every effort he can to kill, steal, and destroy here and now. This battle is spiritual. It's real. This, and it causes conflict in our world. It brings chaos into our life sometimes. Everything seems to be going fine. The spiritual, the spiritual battle we go through teaches us to proclaim the Lord rebukes you teaches us to depend on God's word. Here's more truth to believe and to memorize in Romans 8, 8, 31 to 35. What shall I say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's what God's word says. 32. 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all, how shall he not be with us and freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's God's elect? The answer is no one. It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore who has risen, who is at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Here's the thing. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's a rhetorical question because no one can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing. No accusation in this world. There's nothing anyone could walk in that could separate them from the love of God in Christ when they belong to him. If you belong to Jesus, nothing can separate you. And when these attacks come, the best thing we can do is to proclaim the word of God and to simply claim his power. The word Satan, by the way, means adversary. And this once most glorious angel is against God and his people will no longer to be able to deceive the world. And you know what this brings? Celebration. There's going to be a grand celebration. Look at verses 10 to 12. John says he heard a loud voice in heaven. I don't know about you, but I live in an area when we hear loud things, we pay attention all the time. Loud music, somebody yelling, screaming. He hears a loud voice in heaven, and it says, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren, who's accused them, the brethren, before our God day and night has been cast down. A voice proclaiming that in the heavenly realm, the devil is no longer, his angels are no longer. It's the process of the final cleansing of evil. Verse 11, my life verse, you guys heard me say this about 12,000 times. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies and did not love their life unto the end. And here's the praise, verse 11, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you will dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the seal and to the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. This part to me is so cool because the devil is going to be wiped out, his demons and the cleansing process, and it triggers an outburst of praise. The question I have are who are the people rejoicing in heaven? It's not stated who the voice is. Here's the interesting part. Angels never use the phrase the accuser of the brethren. Why? Because the angels don't reference to us as their brothers, as their family. As we said, they're a little bit lower than the angels. We are described as fellow servants, but never brethren with the angels. These worshipers in these verses are most likely the redeemed, glorified saints in heaven, possibly the prophetic insight of us, the body of Christ, being in the scriptures in a future date, praising God for the cleansing of Satan. Check this out. At one point, we're going to be in heaven. Worshiping and praising God, this circumstance is going to happen right in front of us, and we're going to be here, and we're going to be like, We read about it in Revelation 12, about where we're possibly going to be at some point. But remember, the focal point is never us. It's always Him. We're there to rejoice in Him. I think that's so cool, that we get to see the images of something that could be in the future in a present tense here and now. If you believe you are in the Scriptures praising and worshiping God for all of eternity, we're part of those heavenly voices. And these verses speak of, of, of God's character by saying his power, right? His kingdom of God, which has the authority for, and, and, and of his Christ to come. And only through salvation and redemption of people do humans experience this. God's power and authority uh, desires for people to be redeemed. That's what we have to remember. His heart is for the lost and the broken. He desires people to be bonded with him for all of eternity. Here's the term. God is sovereign. Just so we understand, a lot of times we don't understand new terms when they pop up. I've had to look it up. Now a king is sovereign. Why? They have complete control over everything. Now it's kind of interesting because we call kings here sovereign in their own little territory. But God's authority is where? 
It's everywhere. It's under his rule. He can decide to do anything he wishes in his character, and it's worthy of praise. He's the supreme power of all things, and, in his, and it's not even an effort for him to crush the enemy. So you know what he does in his sovereignty? He's going to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It will happen. There will be a millennial kingdom, a thousand year reign, where Christ himself will reign as king from Jerusalem, and the enemy will be bound for a thousand years, and there will be no sin in the world. We'll get to live how it should have always been. And guess what? During this time, when we're there, and the people that are born during this time, they're going to ask you, how did you make it? Hey, Matt, how did you make it? Mm -hmm. Hey, Andy, how did you... How did you make? Hey, how did you make it? How did you guys ever wander in the world with the devil and the accuser? There's only one answer: we overcame by the blood of the Lamb, and the power of our testimony, and we loved our lives not unto the end. The result of Jesus Christ is that the enemy is defeated, and we overcome. Now, during this time, we see that the enemy is uh, ejected out of heaven and it releases fury on earth. And just to make sure we're on the same page, I'm going to say it again, we're speaking about future events in a past tense. Okay? We're speaking about future events when you read the text through, through, um, through past tense. Um, we do a lot of ministry with people all over. And we work with different denominations all, all along the way. And I want to highlight something. Some people come to us and say, hey, listen, I think there's a devil on me and I need to go to this prayer meeting to be unbound from something. Has anybody ever told you that? You need to go through a special type of prayer or healing process because you've picked up some type of evil spirit along the way. Listen, you don't need to be unbound. You don't need to be delivered again. You don't need to go to an exorcist ritual or a formula. Um, Those things become... Gimmicks and tricks. Why? Because it says it here. How do we overcome? Class? By the blood of the Lamb and the power of testimony. He does it once and for all. Now, we can choose to walk in dangerous situations again, which brings negative consequences. Anybody experience those things? Yeah, all of our hands go up. That's all of us. God's Word tells us that for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal by, mid, by mighty and God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts himself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Our weapons of warfare aren't carnal. They're not physical. The war we fight, we're not going to pick up weapons. It's spiritual. The weapon we have is the word of God. That's how those things are fought. Look at verse 13. It says, as a result of this, this is the outcome. Now the dragon saw that he had been cast out into earth, which is kind of interesting. You're like, are you just figuring this out now? Thank you for understanding sarcasm. When the dragon saw that he's been cast out to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given a two-winged great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time, which is three and a half years from the presence of the serpent. This is what happens, man. During this time, as we, if you go back and reference last week, the woman's looking to make war with, uh, Satan's looking to make war with a woman. Now, we said last week, it's not a physical woman that's, and the reference was, was pregnant with child, no more than the eagles are actual eagles and the cowboys are actual cowboys, right? They're a metaphor that represents a team. Woman is representing Israel here. And she gives birth to a child. We know that. She, uh, Israel birthed Christ, right? We know it came through Mary. But Israel, out of that came Christ and the enemy tried to devour Christ and that didn't happen. So what's he doing now? He's waging war against Israel. Those are the people left behind. There's two witnesses inside Inside this in Israel that are out preaching the gospel, there's 144,000 that are protected, and they're there to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of Israel are going to get saved during that time. And the devil comes and, and um, 
has his way inside the temple, and it causes all Israel to flee because he's looking to destroy them. He's cast down onto the earth with all his demons. His full fury is out. Who am I going after? God's people. So he's coming to destroy his people, which are Israel during this time. And this is what God, God does. Because they're going after him, God sends, miraculously, some type of saving vessel. Now, it's not an actual eagle. This word eagle here could mean condor or griffin, a long spring, a long winged animal. The wings always represent, when we look through the scripture, and the eagle as some type of comfort, some type of rescue, salvation. More proof that God loves the best football team in the world, the Philadelphia Eagles. By the way, that's the third eagle joke today inside the message. You get a bonus out of that. Um, but So God sends a deliverance to Israel to take them out of where they're at and to put them in a place where it says here their own place where they're protected and they're nourished. People say it could be Petra, somewhere in the desert. We don't know the exact place. All we know is that God will rescue his people and set them apart. All right? And it says, she, the woman, Israel, will be nourished for a time. For three and a half years, Israel will be protected on the earth, away from the serpent. Exodus 19 says, You've seen what I've done to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. It's almost like God's using the playbook out of delivering Israel from the Exodus, and he's doing it again. I think it's pretty cool. That's the first attack. He's going to try to attack the woman. There's a second attack. Look at 15 and 16. It says, So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon has spewed out of his mouth. Hey, does anybody know another time on the earth where um, a lot of waters were swallowed up for Israel to be saved? The Exodus, right? Um, the first attack doesn't work, so Satan does what he does. He's persistent. He keeps going. He's looking to attack them again. This could be a great flood. We don't know for sure because it says like a great flood. God's, I think, really specific. If it is a great flood, he would say, but this is something like it. We don't know exactly all we know is that God saves them again and opens up the earth to take away the flood. That's the second. Here's the third attack. Look at 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make more with the rest of her offspring, who keeps the commandment of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan, thoroughly frustrated, knows his end is near, and he's enraged because he's not able to destroy what he wants. He says he goes after the rest of her children, the offspring, those that are not of Israel who have been saved. Now, he's looking for anyone that keeps God's commandments and has a testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the natural turn of events during this time, is he's going to go after anyone who proclaims God. And what I'm saying is we don't have to wait to get that time. We experience that him and now. There's not a whole lot of opposition in your life. I'm not telling you to go out and get some opposition, but you might want to question who you're working for in the kingdom of God. See, if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, the salvation you've been giving is miraculous. Now I want to end on this. I meet with a lot of people. I get a chance to go out and guest speak and share testimonies, and people always say, you have a great testimony. I wish I could have a testimony like you. And my answer is, I don't want anybody to have a testimony. The things I've experienced in my past. Every testimony of a sinner saved is miraculous and worthy of praise and worthy to stand upon. Check this out. Your testimony, each and every one of us, your testimony reminds you of what God has delivered you from. Not me. Our testimony is what God has delivered you from. And that's the power that we work on. Like I said in the beginning, I can look to my past. I know the evil that I walked in. I know the destruction that I did. And I gave my life to Christ. I also know the things I walk in this world that aren't of God. 
We all know that. There should be that conviction of sin. But our testimony is a personal reminder of what God did for us. If you're ever struggling, we look unto the word. We also look to the power of our testimony. We look unto the blood of the Lamb saying, He alone is worthy to be praised. We weren't worthy to be saved, but He was worthy enough to lay down His life unto the kingdom so that we would be slaved, saved from slavery. Your testimony is a personal reminder of what God has delivered you from. Here's where I want to get into something. That word testimony means marturia. That's what it means in the Greek, marturia. And it means evidence given. It means on the record, report, testimony, witness. When we testimony, when we give our testimony and share it, we officially go on the record and declaring what God has done in our life. Just like any courtroom proceeding, you can receive, you, you can read back the testimony that's given. As if you're in a court proceeding. So important. Each one of us has a testimony. Remember it. Remember what God saved me from. Death. Eternity in hell. Sin. Whatever it might be. Addiction. Pornography. You go down the list of all the things that God has set me free. If there's temptation in our life, we proclaim the blood of the Lamb and we share our testimony. No, God delivered and set me free from these things. No, the Lord's going to rebuke me. Hey, the Lord rebukes you. Hey, we have a spot in heaven. This past Thursday, we had one of our community cookouts. And to us, if I can just really be honest, you, you get an idea of how events are. We had the least amount of attendance we ever did. It was probably hotter and more humid than it ever was. 46 people stayed behind to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right on this corner out of this tiny house in Chester. Amen. And guess what? Nine young adults responded by giving their life to Jesus Praise Christ God. and getting baptized. Wow. Happened right here. Right in front of our eyes. Amen. You know what God does? He uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. What? Us, a human, can be redeemed and bonded with God for all of eternity and that starts here and now and we can walk in that because we have no fear of our death anymore to die as a bonus I have no fear whether I live or whether I die the scriptures say I'm his and it gives me the power and the authority to rest in Jesus Christ to witness him because there's already a victory it's already been won we have it right in front of us there's a real devil in this world Paul writes in 2 Corinthians he said another reason I wrote to you was that you would stand the test and of obedience in everything anyone you forgive I also forgive and what I have forgiven if there's anything to forgive I have forgiven in the sight of Jesus Christ for your sake in order that Satan may not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes we have his schemes written his playbook is written out we already know the answers of everything ahead of time we know where he's going it says here so he might not outwit us Paul also writes therefore in order to keep me from being conceited I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me God has been using Satan to bring, to, to, to bring judgment upon this world, to bring humility. It drives us closer into his arms, knowing that there's an accuser out there. And this is what I would say. My son's running towards me in fear, or he's being tormented. There's no doubt I'm going to bend down to scoop him up. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're walking in, whatever challenges you have, today is an opportunity for us to turn our lives over to the Lord. Maybe you've never professed faith. Maybe you did at one point and been walking away from him. Today is the day. There's no condemnation. He willingly receives you, even though there could be a messenger of Satan or sin coming after you. But the word is true. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. No one can bring an accusation against you anymore because of his word. There is real evil. There's a real battle. We see all those things come to an end in this book. And I think it's a glorious time to, to
to praise him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your truth. Thank you, Lord, that the enemy doesn't prevail, that there is a great hope that we have in you. God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.